Um, so this is a city panel, but it's also an arts panel. Things could get a little out of control. You may want to just take note of where the emergency exits are <laughs> before we get into this. Um, before I introduce the panelists who represent an incredible cross-section of the arts, um, I wanted to say something just as a kind of thought bubble to keep up above the heads of us for the rest of the, uh, the hour that we're here. I was struggling to find kind of what are the common themes here and the commonalities between people who do very, very different things in the arts. And I came up with something incredibly obvious, which is that they all care passionately about the art. It may not even be worth saying that, except that in practice what that means is I think almost everybody here believes that there's no question about our cities or even our country that isn't made more interesting, better, and more tractable by having the arts at the table. You know, we often think of the arts as being either a tool or just simply something intrinsically wonderful. And we can say from the beginning that they're both. You know, they're an incredible tool. They can be a teaching tool, they can be a healthcare tool, they can be an economic development tool. And if they weren't more than tools, we wouldn't love them as, they, as we love them. They wouldn't mean as much as they do. But they're also really a way of retooling things. And what's been interesting to me as I talk to the people here is how in many different ways, when the arts are actually at the table and contribute to the decisions that we make, the question changes. So with that said, as my little preaching from uh, the moderator's chair, let me introduce the panelists. Next to me is Rip Rapson. Uh, Rip is the president and CEO of the Kresge Foundation, which has played a huge role in the uh, infrastructure for the arts and uh, is now playing a new role um, in funding different kinds of arts projects, and we're gonna learn more about that. Next to Rip is Jamie Bennett. Uh, Jamie is the executive director of Art Place America. This is a new organization that's looking very locally um, working with something we're calling um, placemaking and the arts, and uh, his organization is funded by a number of the major foundations in this country who I think are turning over the kind of um, decision making to him because he really knows things from having uh, served in many different capacities. He's kind of the Kevin Bacon of the arts. There's only one degree <laughs> of separation from Jamie. Everybody here knows him and has worked with him. Um, he also served uh, in the National Endowment for the Arts as the Chief of Staff and Head of Communications. Uh, next to Jamie is Kate Levin. Kate Levin is now with Bloomberg Associates, but she was for the, uh, the time of the Bloomberg administration in New York, um, the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs. This is the largest single funder of the arts in the United States. Next to Kate is Jenna Echelman. Jenna is an artist. And rather than give the long list of things that she's done, just look at the screens. Her work is on screen here. She's done projects all over the world, and we're gonna learn more about some of those projects uh, in the course of the hour. And then next to Janet is Jed Bernstein. Jed Bernstein is the president of Lincoln Center, and for many years he was also the head of the Broadway League, so he brings to the panel both a nonprofit and a for-profit perspective. So the title of the panel is um, Competing for the Future, Culture and the Successful City. Um, it's Aspen, everybody cares about numbers. So maybe we should just very quickly um, stipulate for the record, so the brief is there, um, about the financial impact of the arts on cities. Um, and I might start with Jed. Um, what can you tell us, the, the 60 second take on what do the arts contribute to New York and its financial bottom line? Uh, well, in my um, Broadway life, uh, we did a, uh, a study every two years, which the Broadway League has continued uh, in my absence, uh, about the uh, economic impact of the arts. And uh, uh, Broadway alone is uh, now contributing about three to four billion a year. Uh, it uh, does that principally in three categories, uh, obviously direct uh, salaries and expenditures uh, for its employees, uh, certainly a portion of um, spending from tourists, Broadway is about two-thirds of the Broadway audience, comes from outside the tri-state area, and there's a formula that is used to uh, separate out those tourists who are what they call culturally motivated and are coming to New York specifically to see Broadway. Uh, and then there's capital investment uh, that the Broadway uh, theater owners and producers uh, make in terms of uh, infrastructure as well as uh, individual shows. Uh, that argument actually has proven so effective that uh, within the last 90 days, uh, New York State approved a tax credit for uh, touring shows that uh, are built to go around the country, uh, that uh, touring shows that are built in New York State and, and uh, uh, are teched or tried out in New York State uh, before they are um, uh, sent around the, uh, the country, uh, you get a tax credit because that does increase jobs and uh, spending. Uh, Lincoln Center alone 
uh, has a $130 million budget. It's almost as big as the uh, budget of um, the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs in New York. Uh, we employ 5,000 people. Uh, we are not as tourist-centric as uh, we will be by the time we get done. Uh, and uh, so we don't get quite the boost of uh, the, the multiplier effect of that. But uh, a big economic driver, and a big economic driver in all five boroughs, because our employees uh, come from all five boroughs. Uh, and uh, so it is definitely a, a citywide uh, impact. I'll just close quickly by saying that uh, having stipulated now to the economic impact of the arts, uh, our new mayor, uh, Mayor de Blasio, um, in the installation of uh, Kate's uh, successor as uh, commissioner, uh, said he too stipulates to the economic impact of the arts, but he thinks the real uh, importance of, of arts and culture in New York is that it makes us better people. And um, it does make us better people. So uh, economics aside, uh, we're important for that reason too. Great. And, Jamie, do you want to pull out to the national level? Um, what can you contribute? Sure, absolutely. So when I was at the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, an extraordinary woman named Joan Shigakawa, uh, who came from the Rockefeller Foundation to serve as our senior deputy chair, was really interested in this question about the economic impact of the arts because lots of people come up with numbers, but the people who come up with those numbers tend to be arts people. And so when arts people come forward and say, hey, we're really good for the economy, you kind of don't believe them. So she went to the Department of Commerce and to the Bureau of Economic Analysis specifically, which is a part of the federal government that calculates gross domestic product. And she said, we're interested in figuring out what is the unique value add of art and culture to the US economy. If you took out art and culture, what would happen to GDP? And so they established something called a satellite account, which looks at a specific slice of GDP. And folks may be generally familiar with travel and tourism, which was a satellite account created in the wake of 9-11. And what they discovered is that art and culture has a unique value add to GDP of $504 billion a year, which works out to be 3.2% of GDP. And just to put that in some context, travel and tourism is 2.8. So travel and tourism 2.8, art and culture 3.2. And if you're interested, if you're one of the wonky Aspen people and want to dig into that, both the BEA and the NEA have put up the numbers and the methodology and they're available for folks to dig into if you just go to arts.gov and take a look at that. Okay. I don't know, have we stipulated sufficiently to the economic impact and can we now move on, you think? <laughs> um, I, I'd like to ask a question about the future, um, what it's gonna look like, how cities will relate to the arts, by kind of going back to the past, a model that we are all familiar with. Um, a city has a depressed downtown, it decides that uh, what it needs down there is an iconic piece of architecture, a new art center. Uh, they go out to a famous architect who designs them something very exuberant and they build it and suddenly people are attracted, they come from all around. Uh, now there's nightlife down there because people are going to performances so there need to be restaurants with the restaurants. Some progressive developer decides that a mixed use uh, development's the next thing and you have people living there and you have a spiraling cycle of economic development and the city is now a competitive city. Um, sometimes this is called the build it and they will come model or the Bill Bow model. Um, I'm curious whether or not that is the model of the future. Um, and I'm gonna throw that out to anybody who wants to take a whack at that. I'll jump in. I, just, I, I think in some sense it's too small a version of the model. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem with that is that different arts organizations have as a natural byproduct of them different patterns of foot traffic. So if you're a city planner who's interested in bringing life to downtown and you just put in a theater on the block, that's great, but the specific foot traffic pattern is 500 people will show up at 8 o'clock and 500 people will walk out at 10.30. So maybe you put that next to a museum or a visual arts organization that might have 500 people visit it over the course of an eight hour day. All right, now we're getting somewhere. And if you augment that further with rehearsal space, uh, space for musicians or visual artists to create, you'll have 10 people walking in and out of the area every hour on the hour. So all of a sudden you've now driven a 12 or 14 or 16 hour pattern of foot traffic that actually is the basis you need for restaurants, for local businesses, for public transportation to come in and to do all of that. And what I find really powerful about that model is that you're not asking the arts organizations to change what they do. 
you're not telling them what art to do, you're just asking them to do it next to each other. And it has this sort of virtuous byproduct, which is people come and want to be around it and see what's going on. So I think that is much more powerful than the sort of lone performing art center. And I was just in Dallas um, for uh, several meetings in a row, one of which was chaired by Adrian Ellis in the Global Cultural Districts. And I made the, if, we, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and Adrian actually corrected me and said, if you go back to the movie, the quote is actually, if you build it, he will come. And the he <laughs> refers to one dead white man, which is the character's father. So that was a sort of important nuance on that. I think, I think the, other, the other problem with that model is that it doesn't take into account the fact that any successful arts enterprise is based on content. And so uh, there's a former mayor of Winnipeg who talked about irritable Bilbao syndrome <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> refer to the failed version of put a shiny toy in your downtown and he and a couple of his friends will hopefully uh, come. So just I, I think the arts infrastructure has to I th be more mindful of actual artists and the content they produce than is often part of the conversation. And it's also, um, it seems to me, a, a focus on one piece of the ecology. Now, D Detroit is our hometown, and when you think about um, the Detroit Institute of Art or the Detroit Symphony, I mean, it, it, it is a sort of a powerful draw, and I think they've done a reasonably good job of, of this kind of surround that Jamie has talked about. But then there are the sort of the mezzo-level organizations that may not be in adjacency to those organizations. They have their sort of own magnetic field or gravitational field. And then there are the, the sort of the feeder organizations into sort of both of those other parts of the ecology, and they tend to be more distributed. And then you've got the sort of the wilds, the folks who are out in the neighborhoods of Detroit um, making art in sort of unusual ways that bear no resemblance to the sort of the, to sort of the more iconic presences. And so I, my sense is that if you were to advise someone uh, like in Detroit of, of how to sort of resurrect community vitality and community cultural activity, I would argue that you sort of have to build the ecology, that you don't end up on just one end of the spectrum. It ends up sort of sucking the energy in to some extent, not always, but sometimes. And I think what we're finding is that the more that the energy is more distributed into the community, it, it ends up sort of staying. It, it ends up connecting with uh, community members better. And it, I think also opens the possibility that the community can shape it in a more profound and realistic way. Given that, I mean, Lincoln Center was sort of designed in the build it and they will come model, you know, a half century ago. Um, but you've been through a lot of changes in a sense to do some of the things that Jamie and Ripper are saying. Tell us about what Lincoln Center is having to do to kind of, in a sense, update, retool that for the current moment. Well, Lincoln Center was sort of the poster child for this. Mm -hmm. uh, it was part of urban renewal on the west side of New York. And uh, what was hoped for happened. Uh, restaurants and nightlife returned, real estate development began. Now it's part of the priciest part of New York uh, to uh, live and work in. And uh, so in that sense, it was a success story. What um, uh, the, the, the big challenge now, and we've just gone through a uh, $1.2 billion uh, physical uh, renovation, and it is beautiful. If you haven't seen it, you should, you know, I can brag about it. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I just got to this job. But um, uh, it, the, the campus is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the question, though, now is, uh, does anybody want to come to uh, consume and participate in art in a centralized location? Is it completely antithetical hmm. to the way everybody is consuming entertainment and culture uh, to come to big buildings at particular times of the day, uh, at a time where you are told, or in an instance where you are told that you must disengage uh, socially. In fact, we yell at you if you try to engage socially while we're presenting what we're presenting. And you don't have a choice, at least when you go to a museum, if you get tired or bored, you can leave. Uh, and a performance at a place like Lincoln Center, you gotta stay at least till intermission, or it's really ugly if you get up <laughs> in the middle. Um, so uh, uh, our challenge now is uh, how do we get that art away from the campus? How do we both uh, through technology and physically uh, get out to a world of engagement, which then will get the cycle going the right way that you'll want to come to be part of the mo mothership uh, because the mothership also docks in all sorts of other locations. An odd metaphor. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, your, your organization um, is in a sense 
doing that, is it centrifugal when you're spreading things out? I mean, you, it's a very centrifugal notion, kind of what, like what Jed's describing. Briefly, tell us what is arts and place making so we have that um, for the audience. Sure, so we're actually, we're a funding collaborative of 14 foundations, including Kresge and Bloomberg, full disclosure. And we invest through a framework that we refer to as creative placemaking. And all we mean by that phrase are projects where people are doing art with the explicit intention of transforming a place. So the activity, the intervention is artistic, but the success of it, the real power of it, will be measured in how it transforms a place. And what's interesting, given the conversation that, that um, we just had, is that we invest in both the hardware, so mm -hmm. buildings and physical infrastructure, but we also very much invest in the software in programming, in the performing arts, in temporary visual arts, to enliven these spaces. I mean, just looking in the front row, we have some extraordinary poets sitting here who don't need a huge building in order to practice their art. We have a fabulous public artist, Ryan Holiday, who's done work that encourages people to explore existing um, civic infrastructure. The fabulous audio piece for the National Mall, for instance, that didn't need a new thing to be built, but encouraged people to come together and explore a sort of common experience. So we just this Wednesday, uh, this past Wednesday, announced, and also the Knight Foundation, Dennis Scholl, who introduced us, is another very important partner to Art Place. Uh, and just this past Wednesday, we announced the 55 latest grants that we made. And we made them to communities all across this country that are sort of fundamentally bringing art and culture into civic planning and civic uh, development, into sort of what we need to do to make and remake our communities so that they're better for the citizens living in there. And so I'm really excited about the full range of them. And what's really fascinating to watch, we've been around over the course of four years, and in year one, we had a lot of applications for pure capital people who just wanted to build buildings. And in this year, the vast majority of the applications were either programming or a mixture of capital investment with programming going on while the thing was being built. Um, so, I mean, just to give a really quick example, one of the favorite projects that we talk about is in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, which just opened a new light rail system, the Green Line, for anyone who's following uh, at home. And now that it's open, it's totally fabulous. But for the three years of construction, life totally stunk. So if you lived in the neighborhood, living near construction is not great. And if you owned a business in the neighborhood, it really stunk because you both had to live next to the construction and no customers were coming as you got known for sort of traffic jams and no parking. And so people started going to the Walgreens across town. So we were able to give some funding to an organization called Springboard for the Arts, which went out and trained 600 local artists in how to partner with local businesses and civic organizations. And then they gave them small grants, sent them out, and said, do whatever you want, just make sure it happens along the light rail corridor. And so over the course of two years, 150 locally initiated, locally produced events took place along this one corridor. So all of a sudden, for the residents, it was a really cool neighborhood to live in. For the business owners, all of a sudden people were coming to see what was going on and were happy to spend some money while they were there. And most importantly, for the light rail project itself, we didn't spend three years teaching people to avoid the neighborhood. We spent three years creating demand for the neighborhood so that when the light rail finally opened, people came in. So that was a really neat example of a software programming project that sort of tied to a significant capital project that you wouldn't necessarily say should be a site for the arts. That's not necessarily, you know, we're building a new light rail line. People's first impulse isn't always, let's deploy 600 artists. Great, great. Jamie gives great segue. Um, he's mentioned light rail and art. And so I want to bring Janet into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Art Place is, uh, has just made a grant for a project that you're working on in Philadelphia. Tell us about the project. What, what is this thing going to look like? What it's, what it's going to do? Where is it going to be? Um, it is the two city block long plaza in front of City Hall called Dilworth Plaza. It, uh, my process, I was brought in, uh, I have, um, my process starts with research. I start understanding how people are using the place. I look at its history. It turned out this area was the original waterworks of the city of Philadelphia. People used to travel from around the country to view it. 
And it, uh, the plaza was created when they tore down the old railway station of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And those trains were run on steam. And it, it turned out, the more I learned about Philadelphia, that the industrial history of the city was not as well represented. You know, the Federalist past was well known. And so I wanted to, to bring that to life in this place that was about water and transportation. And so uh, it's now a hub for three subway lines coming together. And my idea was a very simple one, was to trace the paths of the subway trains in real time above ground. And I needed to find a new material that was appropriate to that message. And so I developed this way of creating curtains of water mist that um, trace this, this uh, it's like an x-ray of the city's circulatory system <laughs> moving in real time. And if you pay attention to it, you might learn something about it. Like, is there more movement north to south at certain times of the day? And also, have you missed your train? <laughs> <laughs> so what's important to me is creating public spaces that are evolving and in flux, that are alive, that, that mean something to us in our lives for those who, who live and see a place every day, that it's changing with the weather, um, and in this case, it's a piece where people can actually interact with it and move through it. Um, we've created this, this mist so that you can walk through in a, in a full business clothing and, and you don't get wet. But yet, if you stay in it for a while, you can play with the water. So um, <laughs> that is the piece. It's called Pulse. And it's a really fascinating project. Mm -hmm. I, I can't wait until I actually get up there to Philadelphia and see it. But the number of organizations and entities and governments and transit systems. Tell us a little bit about how, what are the pieces behind this? How many different organizations are in a sense involved in making this particular work happen? Well, the process in which it came to be is interesting to me. Um, in contrast to what you were saying about, you know, build a shiny toy building, the Bilbao, the irritable Bilbao effect. <laughs> we will. Um, Instead, there was a, uh, a business, a BID, uh, the Center City uh, district of Philadelphia, which is a private business um, improvement. improvement district, thank you. Um, they commissioned a study. They wanted to analyze the urban fabric of the city of Philadelphia, and they wanted to understand where it was strong and where the loopholes were, and they wanted them itemized in terms of what needed really to be addressed most urgently. And it turned out that this central square and where the subways come out, it turned out people would even take the subway an extra stop and walk back, uh, that it was such a, 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 a you know, a public space that wasn't working, and that this needed to be addressed. So with that in mind, they commissioned a team of designers. They did a search for art, an artist, and they made the design happen. And the leader of that uh, business improvement district, Paul Levy, went out and brought the different stakeholders together. They applied for a federal transportation grant that they received, a Tiger grant. They got funding from the state, from the city, from SEPTA, which is their transportation agency, and, and from private foundations. And in fact, the, um, the Knight Foundation, and, and as of last week, Art Places, have been critical players in making that uh, the art component of this major urban uh, renovation uh, happen. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Let me and I, I would contrast that in other cities, and, and like um, my project in Portugal, which is um, you know, I'm getting letters about how it's changed the neighborhood, how people now go, this is uh, in Porto, Portugal, how people will go to visit the art and then suddenly all of these restaurants have started developing around that place and, and that the fishermen, uh, the sardine fishermen, um, now feel that it's their monument. And uh, like that there's this whole cultural, uh, when they took it down for cleaning, they had to put up a billboard that said, you know, it's coming back on this date. And in the soccer stadium, uh, the, the silhouette uh, icon for the city is now this. And uh, when you go on Google Earth, the, the icon for the country of Portugal is the sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we opened up the, the Wall Street Journal, and they were comparing different American cities regards um, airline, um, and the symbol for Phoenix, Arizona, was the sculpture. Well, like, what does that mean, and how did that happen? Phoenix funded this with a bond, you know, a very small part of some larger uh, utility and water um, bond. And so it, it takes a lot of forethought. I don't think it's a kind of like, 
it doesn't just happen. There, it's like a very conscious decision that a city wants to make something happen. Right. I, that, that's interesting because I, I was thinking, Kate, about, you know, art representing cities and whether art in itself is robust enough to kind of give us an image of the city. And I guess I was feeling sort of cynical about that. But then I thought back to um, the Bloomberg administration and the way that history just kept happening during those years. I mean, you, you, the administration came in very shortly after 9-11. Um, that not only like, kills thousands of people and you know, seriously disrupts the cities, but it has a huge impact on the city's economy. And then there's a long debate about what do you do down there, and it's kind of a rancorous period. And then 2008 happens, and suddenly down same neighborhood, you know, economy tanks and takes the world economy with it for several years. And yet, when I think about New York in those years, I, I definitely think of the gates I, in the Central Park. This is the the Cristo um, installation piece. I think of the the Harbor Waterfalls, um, and and I think of the High Line. And I'm wondering when you came in in 2002. Was there a conscious sense that, that art was going to do that? Art was, in a sense, going to um, compete with the shocks, you know, serve as a way of kind of presenting the city um, that could be more, you know, more memorable than all the bad stuff that was happening during that period? Well, the day Mike Bloomberg was inaugurated as mayor, one of the things he said he wanted to do was the Christo Jean-Claude project, The Gates, which had been, you know, making the rounds at that point for... 22 years um, <laughs> since it was first proposed. And so, uh, you know, it was a pretty monumental effort to figure out how to pull it off with lots of stakeholders from, you know, the Audubon Society on, um, thinking that this was a really stupid way of spending time and the privately raised resources for doing it. But I, but I do think in the future, looking back at the history of New York, when that project opened, is up for 16 days in uh, the winter of 2005, it will be looked on as a real turning point for the city, because it was the first time since 9-11 that New York was really front and center in every form of media for something that wasn't about death and destruction. It wasn't about ad hominem attacks. It was about something that was sort of flabbergastingly whimsical and beguiling and creative. It was done by two artists who weren't born in New York, but were part of the 40% of New Yorkers who were born outside the United States. You know, just, it was about public space. It was about giving people an opportunity to like or not like something, but not to not like each other. Um, and the economic impact of that, to your earlier question, was $254 million in 16 days, um, including a lot of extra tips to waiters and waitresses and parking attendants in the areas uh, around um, Central Park that we weren't able to count. Um, but so I, I think all of which is to say public art was definitely, uh, and art and culture in general, was definitely part of what uh, Mike Bloomberg's strategy was for thinking about New York City as a whole and thinking about preserving a competitive advantage in a world that not only had been unthinkably cruel uh, to the city of New York, but also is a place increasingly where people can live anywhere and work if you're gonna locate in a certain place. As you say, it has to be about amenity, but it has to be about that most intangible of things, quality of life, what makes people feel like they have a stake someplace, they have a, a sense of identity, uh, they have a reason to think about and be proud of being where they are. Rip, I have to ask you, because Detroit has had, um, if New York had a decade of shocks, Detroit has had a half century of shocks. So how does Presby work then with the arts to deal with that in Detroit? It's, it's, it's so fascinating to try to bridge from the New York experience to the Detroit experience. I, don't, I tend not to do that too often. But um, th this, the notion of um, building on sort of um, uh, inherent energy, talent, resources to sort of elevate the identity of a place, it seems to me, is what New York is unsurpassed at doing. You know, in Detroit, you have a very different proposition. Uh, there was just a piece in the front page of the New York Times yesterday about the sort of the decimation, once again, of the Detroit neighborhoods and the foreclosures and the blight and the abandonment. And when I think about the potential for the arts to reweave an identity in a community that has in many ways lost its identity. It used to be two million people strong, it had a robust downtown, it was you know, the birth of the black middle class in America. I mean, it, you know, there, there were sort of identity components that have just sort of 
been swallowed up whole with this unbelievable de devastation largely in the neighborhoods. And I think what we're seeing in Detroit is the arts downtown and along sort of the major arterial um, sort of reclaiming sort of vast pieces of real estate that are fairly healthy. I think the, f the fascinating challenge, and I think it's being um, addressed by hundreds and thousands of young people coming in, is how do you take that landscape and reclaim it in a very different way? Uh, at an individual basis, at a community basis, uh, on, a, on the basis of sort of vast disciplines. I mean, we have entire landscape artists, uh, communities of artists in Detroit, trying to figure out what it means to make art in a place that is abandoned. Is it a reclamation of a house? Is it a reforestation project? Is it the unearthing of a creek? Uh, I mean, there are just sort of almost infinite varieties of what you can do. And so the, the opposite side of Detroit's malaise is this almost unprecedented opportunity in America to redefine an urban landscape. Whether art and culture can do that in conjunction with economic forces, with you know, in city good planning and, and all of the rest remains to be seen. But from all indications, it is that the kind of progress that Detroit appears to be making is largely being driven by the arts and cultural community because it takes that kind of imagination and thinking around the corner and into the next generation to reclaim space that everyone else has given up on. And Jamie, from your perspective, where you're, you're dealing with um, a lot of smaller things where there's a lot of social context involved, um, a lot of what you're funding isn't necessarily the, the work of art that you end up with, but the process whereby you get there. What advice would you give to Detroit? Is this a matter of capitalizing some arts institutions, or is this a different question? So, so what I think, so a couple of responses to that. Um, one of the things that I sort of have recently discovered, and I think it's worth paying attention to, because I can do it with three words that start with the same letter, and if you ever achieve alliteration, you know it's worth paying attention to. Um, but I think in this country, we don't recognize that artists are people, so that they have human needs, they have needs for housing and transportation and food and shelter. Artists are product, they're the things that they produce. And there's a fascinating uh, national survey that was done, I can't remember, seven, eight years ago, that said 98% of Americans recognize the value of art in their lives. 27% recognize the role of artists. So I think there's a disconnect, and USA Artists was Sorry. established. <laughs> well, no, and USA Artists was established with the tagline, art comes from artists. So I think where the food movement was a decade ago, <laughs> right, which is we all used to think that steak came from Jerry's IGA down the roll, you know, and we now recognize the role. We don't understand that art comes from artists. We don't understand that, you know, you are that. And then artists are also their process, their way of thinking, their means of problem solving, their means of community engagement. So I think one of the things that's so smart about what Kresge is doing, but Detroit more broadly is doing, is recognizing that artists are valuable as people, as products, and and as process and recognizing all of those needs and all of the strengths. The second thing that I think is so important is that when I began sort of working in this area of creative placemaking, the sentence that most people use in talking with me is, oh, so we'll get artists to move to a place. <laughs> and so artists are always defined as people who don't live anywhere. They're these <laughs> aliens who sort of come from somewhere and spend a time and move off. And what's really powerful about Rip and, and, the, and what he just talked about is that it's recognizing that there are artists who live there. There's a way of reading the language of placemaking as almost colonial. Right? There's a way that you can read that language and sort of say there's a place and I've discovered it. I'm Christopher Columbus, there's a blank slate, there are no people, there's no culture, and I'm coming in and I'm making it. And that's not how we use it and that's not what we mean. We're, there's a wonderful woman that, that both Rip and I have worked with called Maria Rosario Jackson who says it's really important to pay attention to your prepositions. Because if you're talking about doing something to a community, that's a leading indicator that something's wrong with the fundamental framing of the project. Mm -hmm. We're interested in funding projects that communities are doing. Groups of people have come together, identified a need, identified a challenge, and are proposing a solution. So what I love is that in Detroit, 
you have arguably twice as much city as you need for the current population. So there's plenty of room for people to come and join Detroit. I'm not you know, saying everyone needs to stay where they are, but there's also a great recognition of people like Powerhouse Productions or Youth Nation or some of the really extraordinary organizations that are dug into Detroit and have been for some time. So I think paying attention to artists in their fulsomeness and also paying attention to the resident artists, the indigenous artists, I think are two of the things that Detroit is really getting right. Let me let me ask about your fulsomeness, Jenna. Um, <laughs> you're an artist. Uh -oh. <laughs> you're an artist, and you've made a decision about where you want to live. Um, where do you live, and why do you live there? I've lived in so many places. So maybe I am the itinerant. I lived in <laughs> Bali, Indonesia, for five years. I've been working in India. I lived in New York City, very near um, Lincoln Center. I would, you know, I would show up not knowing which uh, performance I would go to. It's like, hey, let's just go and see who's getting rid of tickets and, and we'd have this, you know, like what a fabulous amenity to life. Um, and now we live in Coolidge Corner in the Boston area where we have um, sort of the coming together of science and technology and design community and an incredible uh, fabric of life for our kids to walk to a public school that speaks 29 languages. So um, that's, you know, each phase of life I have Drawn, been drawn to different places for different, you know, different things. Right. I, I wanted to ask Kate about artists in New York. Um, if you live outside New York, there seems to be a sense that it's an expensive place to live. Um, what is New York doing at this point to be sure that it's competitive in the sense of that artists are, are going there, working there, making art there? New York has always been an expensive place to live. So, you know, the, in that sense, the sky has always been falling. Um, that said, uh, Ironically, it's a problem of success. Real estate pressures have now extended because of <coughs> successful economic development policies uh, to larger and larger swaths of the city. So uh, one of the things uh, city government's doing, we um, created, and actually Jamie was involved in the early days of this, uh, a, a nonprofit real estate development company uh, called SpaceWorks, whose sole goal in life is to create affordable rehearsal and studio space mm -hmm. for artists. Um, we also, when I worked for the city, made a special point through our uh, capital program to fund uh, organizations that were building studio and rehearsal space, that um, particularly space that, that could be subsidized, and, and tried to ensure that the footprint of new facilities included that kind of space, uh, space for actually making art, not just consuming it. Uh, so um, there are a number of amazing private nonprofits that are working to do the same kinds of things. And I think ultimately that's really the, the core strategy. Again, it's what we've been talking about. You have to be mindful of the fact that art comes from artists and make sure that they, although they don't always behave like a sector, have their production needs um, taken care of the same way any other manufacturing class uh, might do. Because, you know, again, I think that's the, the problem is that there seems to be uh, this, this sense of illusion that art just appears full blown and the process of making it. There's during the 2008 uh, debacle over uh, trying to limit or eliminate any federal aid that could go to artists and arts organizations. Um, a uh, elected official in Washington um, talked about how uh, it, it shouldn't go to artists because in his state there were real people that needed real jobs. <laughs> uh, and and you know, I, think, I think that's a very dangerous and scary uh, perception that you know, we all need to be extremely uh, concentrated on figuring out how to reverse in this country. Mm -hmm. Kate and I um, were on a committee uh, that she chaired uh, that uh, gave uh, grants tied to a uh, real estate development uh, scheme, sort of a, a, a tax on uh, real estate, a certain real estate development in a certain area of New York, which went to fund uh, uh, arts programs. And one of the, I thought, more innovative grants that we gave was to the Lark Theater Company, which is a small theater company, and it was specifically on Kate's point, which was to say that it was, um, it was for playwrights, and it was uh, money that provided an apartment in New York and health insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, not the two sexiest things. You, you expect playwrights to live in some ethereal world mm -hmm. where they think up great ideas and write brilliant plays. 
and you forget the fact that they get sick and they need to go to doctors and they need to have health insurance and that they actually need a place to live to think these great thoughts. And so it wasn't sexy, but it was so incredibly uh, necessary and you know, good for the Lark Theater for being uh, willing to do that. The Actors Fund, uh, same thing, uh, working in the area of health insurance for artists at a very, very basic level, which is people have to live and have a life if they're gonna be expected to create. You know, we've had a number of really good ideas and interesting things like that, which sounds like so, so obvious and yet potentially so powerful. Um, I, there's always the frustration of sort of how do you sell this to the bean counters? Um, you know, how do you make a case for this in the terms that people who actually are distributing money, um, running for office and so on, that they can understand? Um, and I'm, I just like to get some thoughts on that. Maybe I'll start with Jamie just briefly. You said something that, at breakfast today about bring a translator. Maybe you can tell us mm -hmm. what that means. So this, I'm going to tell a story um, about Kate in front of Kate, which is always dangerous. <laughs> but uh, when Janet and I were talking this morning about uh, public artists and working um, in public spaces, one of the things that I don't think you get a lot of preparation for as part of your MFA is how to deal with permitting issues. And oftentimes when you're doing a really extraordinary project in a really extraordinary place, you not only have to speak one kind of permitting language, you have to speak federal DOT, you have to speak a regional transit authority, you have to speak department of buildings. So in New York City, um, we have a fabulous organization called Make Music New York, which is our version of Fête de la Musique. So every June 21st, everyone goes outside and makes free outdoor music. And it's sort of a fabulous thing that's celebrated around the world. And in the first year that this um, project was gonna happen, this young guy called Aaron Friedman was going around from police precinct to police precinct and saying things like, hey, I'm gonna bring 76 trombones and put them on the corner on Thursday, isn't that great? And not surprisingly, the police officer is like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, go away. And I think one of the most important things that Kate, when she was commissioner and deputy mayor Patty Harris and Mayor Bloomberg did for public art during their 12 years is realize that what we really needed if we wanted more art in public spaces is a translator who could translate from artist to bureaucrat. And so we took the exact same Make Music New York proposal, partnered that guy up with a guy called Evan Korn, who was sort of the designated translator for the city, he went to the same police precinct, and rather than saying what Aaron said, he said, officer, we have a First Amendment freedom of assembly unamplified event that won't impede means of egress. <laughs> and the police officer went, oh, okay, fabulous. Did you say Thursday? <laughs> and the thing happened. And I think, Janet, you were talking a little bit about this with some of your projects, that you sort of walk into these things, and it's like, well, I can talk about color and research, but I can't necessarily talk about environmental impact and, and these other items. Right. This project I just installed in Vancouver is 750 feet from the top of a skyscraper over street, plaza, and waterway. And it turned out I needed the Federal Aviation Authority, I needed the Port Authority, the city owned the streets, the province owned the plaza, but the airspace above the plaza was owned by the provincial government. So, I mean, it was astonishing. Um, these aren't things that, you know, I'm focused on creating the best art I can to enliven the civic space. And this is a project that's designed to travel from city to city, just attaching to things that already exist. So getting each building owner to say, yeah, we're gonna let you attach an artwork to the, our roof. Um, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask Kate something before we go to questions, because I think we're getting down to that point. And it's about something you said when we, we spoke um, a few weeks ago. And it was such a good idea that I can't possibly paraphrase it. Um, but you said that when, in a sense, people who care passionately are to trying to make that case to people who can deal with permits and budgets and so on, that there's a kind of cognitive bait and switch about mm. the arts, the experience of the arts, versus actually making stuff happen in the arts with all those other pieces. What, what did you mean by that? I think the most people, when they think about the arts, why it's important, it, it's about a very personal response. I went and saw something, and that's, that's how I understand my world, is through my own experience. And you know, the arts are, if you like them, a very specific and transformative kind of example of that. It's also the case that we have a vision of artists, if we do it all, it's sort of the lone genius problem. Um, you know, if they're starving in their garrets, 
that's too bad. If they're wild celebrities, I guess some, in some quarters that's considered better, but, but they are looked at as individuals and not in fact part of a community. I don't know of any artist who doesn't function in fact as part of a passionate community one way or another because that's, you know, it, it, it's, the, it, it's that kind of collaboration bouncing off of each other's limits that I think inspires and sustains people whether or not they ever find commercial success. Similarly, you know, I, there, there's so much competition among arts organizations for funding, there tends to be the sense that it's about an organization. All of which is to say the bait and switch is the, the arts present themselves as a series of individual points of light when in fact they are a vast sector that are enormously diverse in terms of discipline, in terms of the things that they're trying to achieve. You have not only large versus small organizations, you have organizations whose mission is to present art at the highest level of virtuosity, and you have organizations that are essentially human service organizations working uh, to combat some form of disease or social problem through an arts-based set of tactics. So I think it can be very difficult for city leaders to recognize that there is a whole set of strategies and a whole wealth of possible benefits that can come from engaging this community. It's also the case that individual artists are, as Jamie said, they're, they're, they're not housebroken. They don't speak permit. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, and certain organizations can be enormously nimble and collaborative or they can be, you know, highly idiosyncratic and uh, sort of self-involved. But if you can get a grip on the fact that there is a huge ecology here, you move out of the spate and switch, individual versus sector, and you start seeing a whole landscape of opportunity. You know, one minor example, um, when I worked for the city, we spent a lot of time on uh, converting a bunch of abandoned um, properties in downtown Brooklyn into a uh, series of developments, all of which were inflected by a major cultural facility. One of them, um, the Theater for a New Audience, uh, got its first permanent building for the first time ever. And for those of us that were here and saw Julie Taymor's production of Midsummer Night's Dream, that was the show that inaugurated this new building. And she had directed uh, some of her first work at the organization back when it had started. So this has had uh, a transformative impact. It's right next to the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It's near the Mark Morris Dance Center. So it's not that it was built in a wasteland, but literally because of the quality of the coffee it serves, it has started pulling people down a block that for 40 years had been abandoned, even though there's all kinds of wonderful stuff right next to it. And on the basis of this whole level of development, there's another organization you know, that uh, was um, built and put online and opened at roughly the, the same time. There are now 29 commercial developments in the neighborhood surrounding it. Um, a lot of that is, again, due to enlightened economic development policy for which Mike Bloomberg and Bob Steele, who was Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, um, were responsible for. But in certain circumstances, that whole commercial development rationale would get put just on the economic development side of the ledger and not credited to the excitement around the arts piece, which is really what started generating it. The High Line you know, in Manhattan is a more obvious example of that. So I think the, the bait and switch, is it one individual thing or is it this full spectrum of opportunity that you can't predict, you can't quantify in the same way that you can you know, often quantify the benefit of certain kinds of transportation or other infrastructure. But I think if you look at the arts as a form of infrastructure, it's one way of getting beyond the one-off notion and beginning to understand a, a much wider and enormously powerful uh, set of strategies. So you've brought us back to where I was hoping we'd start and we in fact got there in the end. Uh, I think we're getting to the point where we could take a few questions. Um, we have a little more than five minutes. Um, and there's one here. Is this the microphone system? Yes. OK. Um, maybe we'll start and just work our way down. Hi. First of all, thank you very much for the eye-opening presentation. Um, uh, I noticed that the, the cities you used as examples of creative placemaking, Porto in, in Portugal, um, uh, New York, even Bilbao, um, had something in common in that they had some kind of uh, foundation, whether it be a certain po uh, population density or European centralized structure. Um, I come from a, a middle-sized town in Iowa, um, and though I'm a high school and can't do too much to change it, I'm wondering um, 
uh, how can we, because we're starting to, to use arts to try and revitalize the downtown, what kind of foundation do we need to um, actually make that effort valuable? So it's interesting because a lot of people sort of automatically go to the urban place when we have the creative placemaking conversation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the communities, we've invested in something like 133 <coughs> communities over the last four years. The smallest has 421 people living in it. And the largest is New York City with 8.3 million. So we've, we've invested in the entire range. And there are some extraordinary folks that have emerged as sort of national leaders. Um, worm Farm, Worm like a worm, Farm like a farm, in Sauk County, Wisconsin, has done some amazing work pairing art with agriculture. So in addition to having roadside farm stands, they have roadside art stands made by local artists. The stands themselves are made by local artists and they also sell local art. And then they actually put temporary works of public art in the landscape to encourage people to get off the road, the main drag, and sort of explore the neighborhood. Um, there's a, a fabulous grant that we just announced in Virginia that's actually a network of 10 small towns each of one has some sort of theater space in their downtown. So they've actually come together and are going to create a regional touring network so that there's a way for them to jointly invest in a production that will move around these 10 rural Virginia towns. And particularly in the rural setting, we've seen what we're sort of calling serial linked placemaking where you sort of brand a region with an identity, but then give people reasons to visit more than one place within it, because not all small communities in that, in that region are the same. So you, know, you should give people a chance to explore. So depending on what your interests are in that town, if you'd like to connect with me, I'm happy to connect you with some of the folks that are actually doing the work who are much smarter about it than I am. But there is nothing in creative placemaking that necessitates uh, an urban environment in order to succeed. Great. Down here. Hi. Um, this relates to arts and its economic impact on communities. Um, what we're seeing in cities such as New York, Berlin, and what I'm seeing personally in Chicago is that in a lot of neighborhoods that are historically and culturally rich, that are full of people of color, that are full of people with low incomes, um, are being seen as uh, pioneering grounds for artists of other communities. Uh, to come into those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, and whether, it's whether it's unintentionally or intentionally, um, moving into these neighborhoods um, and eventually gentrifying them um, by having people who own these buildings drive the rent up and attracting businesses that allow, um, that allow landlords to do so, ultimately driving out the cultures um, that attracted art, these artists into those neighborhoods in the first place. Um, more specifically with Pilsen and Humboldt Park and Bronzeville in Chicago and Harlem and Brooklyn and New York. Um, how do you guys think overall and over time that will affect the landscape um, of these cities, not only economically, but socially? What I will say is that the, the artists for a long time have been kind of the shock troops for creating real estate value. I think it has gotten to the point, I mean, the, the neighborhood of Soho in New York is sort of the flagship example of getting priced out of the thing that you develop the value of for artists. Uh, urban leaders, I am hopeful, are getting more mindful of that. And that's why, to me, you know, you, you, ultimately, it, it's not wise for government to intervene too uh, thoroughly in property values. But what cities do need to be much more thoughtful about, not cities, urban areas in general, um, and you know, rural as well eventually, is making sure that artists have a place to make work. Because that's what ultimately having the vibrant presence of artists in a community making stuff, whether or not they live there, ideally if they can, um, that's what defines creative neighborhoods. And so I think you know, the Soho story unfolded I would say between you know, 1955 and 1980. It's a long period of time for that to take place. And the reckoning, I think, is only now starting. But I do think there, there's a real opportunity for a much smarter kind of urban policy that ensures that the people who are creating the value get to benefit from it. And that's really the key. I'd love to answer that question, even though I'm not on the panel. Um, <laughs> we have the same thing happening in Washington. It's not always artists, but it's, it's just gentrification. And when people 
talk about what they're losing through gentrification. Very often they'll say it's the barbershop on the corner or the little restaurant that we used to go to every week. And, it, and people feel like, well, there's nothing we can do about that. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's real estate, it's prices. I've often wondered why couldn't you have a sort of business preservation policy where people in a community might say, you know, get together and say, these are the three businesses that actually really were places of kind of communion for this neighborhood. And then use tax incentives, tax credits, the other things that we oftentimes use for big businesses to preserve those businesses in some way in the communities. Mm -hmm. So that you don't just get, you know, Foot Locker and Starbucks and the rest of the thing. But anyway, I'm not supposed for, to- For what it's worth, Philip, that when, when we did the rezoning of 125th Street in Harlem in New York, one of the things we did was a, a series of zoning moves to try and incentivize mm -hmm cultural businesses and try and prevent ATMs from colonizing. So again, I think people are just trying to figure out this is something they want to do, they should do, and what are the tactics for doing it? In just 30 seconds, and really interesting, I'd love to have this conversation in depth, so if you have time afterwards. But just a really quick thing is if you look at the Tenderloin neighborhood in San Francisco, the Kenneth Raynan Foundation has been the lead funder behind something called the Community Art Stabilization Trust, which is actually doing what you were talking about, Philip, but looking at the nonprofit arts organizations that might get displaced from the neighborhood. So using philanthropic dollars, they're buying buildings in neighborhoods where the property values are about to go up, so they're locking in the low value, selling it back to the nonprofit over a long time, so the nonprofit is both able to remain in place and benefit from having an appreciating asset. So there are a number of people interested in actually getting to solutions. So I'm interested in connecting those people. So, so that's too long for a short answer. I had one good idea, and it turns out they've had it before me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're out of time. Uh, we're at the point we have to say. So thank you to the panelists.